My biggest issue in politics would be climate change and how it will affect our futures. Education. Housing. Youth involvement in politics. Migrant rights. Climate action. And the issue that matters most to us is freedom of movement between north and south of Ireland. Yeah, just being able to move cross-border without any issues. A prospering job market. Our biggest political issue is the decriminalisation of cannabis. Our biggest issue in regards to um, politics is women's rights in regards to abortion and sexual assault. So what really matters to this generation of voters across the island of Ireland? Brexit, the prospect for Irish unity, climate change, or something completely different? We've come to the Good Summit at Trinity College to let them put their questions to some of the decision makers. The Sinn Féin leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, Fine Gael TD, Neil Richmond, and joining us from Westminster, the DUP leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. I get to talk to these people fairly regularly, but this is your opportunity. Uh, my question's for Geoffrey, though. I'm a 26-year-old unionist from Northern Ireland, and our greatest concern as our generation is, at this moment in time, is not our identity always to, or our, our uh, tradition to the United Kingdom, it is for our opportunities. Is it not a social responsibility to make sure that it is something to guide the opportunities and to actually stay and, and work for um, the young people in Northern Ireland and with the Irish government to create those cross-border opportunities? I accept entirely your point that what really matters to young people and to their families as well is that they have a, a decent future. I wouldn't be in politics if I didn't want to achieve those things and it's not just the Irish government. Bear in mind that many of the opportunities for our young people flow from um, being in the United Kingdom and um, uh, therefore it means working with our government at Westminster as well. Um, but I'm more than happy to um, uh, work with the Irish government on matters that help to boost our economy um, and uh, enhance cooperation. But as I've said, at the moment, um, some of those opportunities at least are being undermined by um, what is happening in relation to the protocol. So we can't forget that the protocol, the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement are a joint product of the EU and the British government. No one has single ownership of this. Plenty of people have ownership over Brexit and I'm certainly not one of them. But I think what you had was the European Commission taking a very reasonable stance of going to actually talk and engage and listen to the business people, the political leaders and the community leaders in Northern Ireland to say, well, how is this impacting you? How can we make it work better? Can't make it work perfectly because Brexit is ensuring that nothing's working perfectly and we just have to look at the petrol forecourts or rivers in England to see that Brexit's having a, a pretty bad impact over there. Um, my question's for Mary Lou. <laughs> um, as you said, you say the way forward is for United Ireland, but has there actually been thought into what a United Ireland would look like? Is there a plan in place? When I'm asked generally about uh, Irish unity, I get asked the following. What about the anthem? What about the flag? What about, you know, um, a public holiday for the 12th of July, which I, can, I, I think is a good idea. So I'm happy. But we get into all of that. I, I respectfully suggest that's the wrong place to start in my head. Where I would start is with our health service. So what I think needs to happen, Megan, is not to rush. I'm not saying let's gallop to the polls next week and have the referendum. That clearly would be, you know, farcical. But what I am saying is let's not lose time now to start planning and discussing the practical bread and butter issues that matter. Um, do you believe, I suppose, that issues of identity uh, got in the way of uh, a unified response to COVID? Uh, considering, obviously, that I did, like, science doesn't care about your identity and Ireland is um, an epi epidemiological unit, it's a single entity um, in that sense. So do you believe that that is the case? There were times when, you know, unionists like me opted to take uh, measures in Northern Ireland that were different from those in Great Britain. So, for example, I'm in London at the moment, um, and it is not compulsory to wear a face covering here, whereas that remains the case in Northern Ireland in many settings, that 
wearing face coverings is compulsory. So it doesn't follow that as a unionist, I just adhere to what is decided in London or Cardiff or in Edinburgh, um, or indeed in Dublin for that matter. I think we have to look as politicians at the unique circumstances uh, of our own communities and, and decide uh, on that basis and on a consensus basis where possible, how we deal with these uh, matters. So I don't think that identity, whether you're British or Irish, was a determining factor in how uh, we responded to the uh, pandemic. What is the most extreme measure the Irish government is willing to put in to pretend, prevent climate change? You know, this is our one planet. This is, I'm 16, this is my future is going to be greatly affected by this. How, how extreme is your actions going to be? Yeah, well, obviously it's not one action. But I think it's a combination of actions and it's also the reward as well. So I think a lot of people are saying, well, we need to ban this, we need to remove that, and I fundamentally agree. So, agree. so one of the obvious ones is banning the tailpipe car, so you won't have, be able to buy an unleaded, a new unleaded or diesel car by 2030 in the States. It's fairly serious, but it's also rewarding to making sure that we spread out public transport to make sure that's an option to provide more funding for cycle lanes in, in urban areas, but also to move our public transport and our public utility fleet over to renewables completely. So that's why we see hydrogen buses coming on stream in Dublin. I think that's the key thing, but it's also to look for the penalties for those who are breaking um, the guidelines, the commercial polluters, for want of a better word. And I think if you look at all in a combination, we can get there. And we also need to, I'm very strong about this, we don't need to think climate measures are somehow always a punishment. There can be huge opportunity, huge opportunity for not only for people to have a better lifestyle, but also for people to make money and may have a very good uh, occupation on the back of it as well. The truth is that in the absence of alternatives, in the absence of public transport, in the absence of retrofitting, things that actually reduce emissions, carbon taxes in and of themselves won't change behaviour. They become a cash cow for the state. They become merely a revenue raising uh, instrument. And I think that has been a real problem with the political discourse around the climate emergency.